Hello, everyone, and welcome to another podcast uh, from the EP section here at the Cleveland Clinic. I'm Osama Wazni. I'm the section head, and today with me is Dr. Pasquale Santangeli. He's the director of our VT Center. Today, we have two topics for you. We're going to talk about something called ARVC, or rhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. And then we're going to talk also about ventricular tachycardia and the difference between dilated cardiomyopathy and patients who have ischemic cardiomyopathy. So, Pasquale, welcome, and thank you, uh, thank you for joining us today. So, let's start with the ARVC. Could you give us a, um, an understanding or a definition what ARVC, especially to our patients who will see this term in their charts, they'll look and, and see, what, well, I have ARVC. What the heck is ARVC? Yeah. Um, let us know. Thank you. So, ARVC, or arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, is, uh, of course, a disease of the heart muscle uh, that is a basis, um, genetic basis, is familial, and is characterized by essentially replacement of the heart muscle by um, fat tissue and by scar tissue, essentially. It's called arrhythmogenic because uh, in the process of electrical, um, we call it depolarization, it's electrical flow through the heart is interrupted by the scar tissue and fat tissue and it can create some short circuits, which can trigger very malignant arrhythmias, including ventricular tachycardia or even ventricular fibrillation. It can lead to sudden cardiac death. That's why it's so important to recognize. So what is the presentation? So how does a patient know that they have ARVC? Or when should a patient be concerned, uh, you know, and consider ARVC? Or is this something that the doctor usually diagnose, diagnoses in, in these patients? It does require some uh, index of suspicion. Uh, typically, the presentation is with ventricular arrhythmias. It can range in between, uh, of course, VT, which is ventricular tachycardia, or even fibrillation, the most extreme versions and, and forms of it. But also, some patients just have uh, a PVCs, so isolated beats. And of course, there are some features uh, from the electrocardiogram that you'll be familiar with, and also from imaging, which we, we do, including CT scan and MRIs and echocardiograms. And we use some criteria to diagnose. But of course, first of all, uh, whenever there is a patient with very frequent arrhythmias, symptomatic ventricular arrhythmias, we need to make sure we rule out, especially if they come from the right ventricle, which is the right side of the, of the heart, essentially, we need to make sure that we rule out underlying arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So let me try to just summarize uh, so yeah. far. So the patients will pre basically present, or a patient will have palpitations. So a feeling that ha they're having extra beats. And then they'll go to the doctor, and the doctor may do an EKG. And on that EKG, they may find something called the PVC, which basically an extra beat from the lower chamber. That's right. And then, then based on the EKG, then there will be some suspicion that this may be ARVC. So that is really a diagnosis that the doctor will do, and then will refer to the specialist. Now, when they come to us, we will do that EKG. We'll look at it. We'll get an echo to look at uh, the heart. Uh, we may need to do an MRI. And then finally, the diagnosis is basically a combination of all of these findings in addition to the symptoms of the patient. Is that correct? Absolutely. And the, really, this uh, involves also collaboration with different sections from our perspective. We do collaborate with genetic counselors. We collaborate with uh, the heart failure section to make sure that we don't treat only the arrhythmia aspect of it. And we really have a comprehensive care about the ARVC. So now we made the diagnosis. Before we go into the management and the yeah. treatment, we started off by saying that this is familiar. Yes. Uh, and so it's something that could be inherited. Yeah. So who are the family members that we have to also screen for in this situation? Yeah, the immediate family members usually, and we have a collaboration with the children's hospital for people that are less than 18 years old of age uh, for family screening. And we screen them typically with an EKG electrocardiogram, Sometimes we do halter monitors and sometimes imaging, depending on what the index of suspicion is. And of course, uh, now that we have genetic testing, if a patient presents with uh, a clear mutation that is uh, essentially a ver that, that, that causes the disease, then we can screen for the same mutation their family members. All right. So now let's uh, move on to the management. So what is uh, the first thing or first step in the management of once we identify that they have the disease and we made the diagnosis? What are the next steps? Yes, this is a really important. Uh, typically, we try to understand essentially what is the risk of sudden death for the individual patient, which is sometimes is quite challenging because especially for patients that never had an episode of sustained, between prolonged arrhythmias, 
it becomes challenging to understand what the risk is. So we do a series of tests, usually that involves imaging, and very often involves uh, uh, taking them to the EP laboratory to understand whether there is anything that we can induce in terms of the arrhythmia. And also we try to localize, uh, to confirm if the scar that was localized on the MRI is really uh, present and what the uh, risk of that scar is. So we do some tests for that. And after that, we have a good understanding of what the potential future risk will be. Okay. And if the risk is high, then we implant an ICD, correct? correct? Yeah. So most of the patients who have an established diagnosis of ARVC will end up with a defibrillator to prevent sudden cardiac death. Now, we've been faced with many of our patients who get the defibrillator, but then they, they have a ventricular tachycardia or a fast heart rhythm that can be dangerous, and then the device kicks in and they receive a shock. So now they're getting shocks, recurrent shocks. What would you do with those patients? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, first of all, we need to really make sure the device was programmed in such a way um, that the shock was really, first of all, necessary. Uh, because sometimes, especially in other centers that program that, that, that shock patients are fully, essentially still awake during, during tachycardia, which is really not a pleasant experience. But having said that, after you have a ventricular tachycardia, we have very good methods and uh, techniques to essentially prevent it in the future. And of course, typically, the strategy is either antiritmic drugs, uh, so medications that really don't work that great for this condition, to be honest, has been studied in different uh, centers. But here, we have a special expertise in catheter ablation of uh, ventricular tachycardia and arrhythmias in general. And in particular for ARVC and our diseases similar to the ARVC, the uh, region of interest is really on the outside surface of the heart, which is the most challenging one for, uh, uh, for most electrophysiologists here. We do it almost on a uh, daily basis, this type of procedure. So for us, it's almost like routine. But really, if you want to really address this problem from the source and to be very successful, you need to have a comprehensive ablation procedure, which includes ablation on the inside surface, that is called endocardial, as well as on the outside surface, which is called epicardial ablation. And these are very good long-term results. We published actually years ago about six-year follow-up for most ARVC patients and no VT 75% of cases on no medications, essentially, just uh, uh, low-dose beta blockers, which is really uh, almost nothing, essentially. So the results are very good, as long as it's done comprehensively in a center like ours. Yeah, and we've had a lot of patients, once we do their ablation, they basically just stay on a beta blocker, which is really a uh, low-dose medication, and a medication with very mild side effects, if any. Uh, and the outcomes have been, have been great. But it's important to stress that they, patients need a comprehensive ablation, which means we have to ablate from inside the heart and outside the heart. The way we get to the inside of the heart is through veins and arteries, if needed. Um, and from the outside of the heart, we have to go through, uh, under the breastbone into what we call the epicardial space, meaning just uh, under the envelope that covers the sac that covers the heart. And uh, we have a great expertise here. Um, we do it uh, on a weekly basis, if not day daily basis. And um, our success rates have been great with very low complication rates. Absolutely. Uh, all right, so that's, uh, I think, uh, everything we have on ARVC. Uh, to summarize, patients will come in with uh, palpitations. Uh, they'll get uh, some monitoring, find extra beats from the lower chamber. Something has to point us in the direction of ARVC. Usually that's an abnormal EKG. Then the workup will include an echo. And most of the time we get an MRI, then genetic testing to confirm. Uh, if patients continue to have problems, then despite medications, uh, then we would uh, perform an ablation that will entail endocardial from the inside and epicardial from the outside of the heart. And most of these patients will end up also needing a defibrillator to protect them from events in the future. Thank you very much for your attention and we'll see you for the next podcast. Thank you.